Arts and STEM. I'm Erwin Weiser, Justin S. Morrill, Dean of Liberal Arts. Uh, first, let me take a moment to welcome Purdue President Mitch Daniels uh, to tonight's event, and we're really pleased you could join us tonight, Mitch. Thank you. It's been a thought-provoking and exciting day as we've considered the special opportunities afforded us in the College of Liberal Arts at Purdue. Our first faculty panel this afternoon explored the timeless, relevant, and essential role of the liberal arts in higher education. The second panel provided insights into the ways in which, at Purdue, our liberal arts faculty work in dynamic and meaningful ways with our colleagues in science, technology, engineering, and math disciplines, and how these partnerships have broadened the ways we think about our place at Purdue. I'd like you to join me in thanking our faculty panelists and moderators for the insights they shared with us today. Tonight's event is the culmination of a months long planning process, but also an even longer conversation about the liberal arts at Purdue and the unique niche we fill. As we considered and discussed the debates in both the academic and popular press about the future of liberal arts and the importance of study in the STEM disciplines, we saw a repeated refrain that pitted one against the other. The more we read about the choice of liberal arts or STEM facing our institutions, our faculty, and our students, the more determined we became to start a new conversation. And that conversation begins tonight. We believe that Purdue, uniquely positioned at the intersection of liberal arts and STEM, should lead a national conversation about how our disciplines, in partnership, challenge all students intellectually, enabling them to be independent thinkers and bold visionary leaders. So tonight, we will hear from national business and higher education leaders about how liberal arts and STEM are enriched and have greater capacity for meaningful change when the disciplines intersect. Now, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our moderator for tonight's conversation. Purdue alumni, alumna Dr. Moira Gunn stands squarely at the nexus of technology, science, and society. Through her public radio program, Tech Nation, she has interviewed guests ranging from CEOs to scientists, venture capitalists to politicians, teachers to technophobes. From the moment we envisioned this event, we knew that she would be the perfect person to lead tonight's discussion. Dr. Gunn, thank you for joining us tonight, and we look forward to the conversation. And thanks again to all of you for being here. Thank it's you. Let me tell you why I'm such a big fan of Bud Weiser. Number one, his name. <laughs> you gotta love a guy whose name is that. But also, you've been such a tremendous support over the years, and you, there was nothing in your fear. Every so often, you said, hey, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? And you've been terrific, and I just want to give you a big round of applause. <laughs> now, let me introduce the panel. First, we have Chuck Jones to my immediate left. Uh, the Chief Design and Research and Development Officer at Newell Rubbermaid. <laughs> then, someone familiar to you all, Leah Jamison, the John A. Edwardson Dean of the College of Engineering here at Purdue. <laughs> then, Jackie Jones Royster, the Dean of the Ivan Allen College of Liberal Arts at Georgia Tech. And finally, Bracken Darrell at a, works at a place that uh, that we're being. Um, he's a mess of a man. is a really good thing. He is the president and CEO of Logitech. <laughs> now we thought we'd start with a question, and I'm, I'm dying to hear the answer here. Um, and for each of you. Um, Standing at the intersection of liberal, liberal, liberal arts and STEM, and you might reveal sort of your, where you think you might, your leanings are, um, what for buildings, landscapes, people, whatever you see, 
are at each corner. Chuck, let me start with you. Sure. Um, you know, so, so for me, I think that when I think about the intersection of uh, liberal arts and STEM, I always think uh, immediately of artists and technologists. Uh, I, you know, so when I think about these things coming together, uh, I think about people like Leonardo da Vinci. I think about um, uh, you know, folks that uh, you know, have these renaissance skills of being able to bridge uh, across these disciplines and to bring uh, great designs, great art, but also great technical solutions uh, to the world. So, um, yeah. So, so Leonardo's on one corner. Yeah. So Leonardo's on one. Well, actually, I would say Leonardo embodies all corners. But um, uh, you know, a I've real got, estate developer. I, I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got to give Leonardo a little bit of credit here. Um, you know, but I think you know also too. I mean, if you look at um, um, you know great artists, uh, you know Pablo Picasso on one side. You know, you've got uh, you know someone like uh, Enrico Fermi on the other. Um, so both are problem solving problems in a very creative way, but a very different way. And I think that uh, how you begin to untap, uh, tap into and unlock how that creative problem solving process works and how you can begin to um, um, you know, really maximize that creative potential is uh, very exciting. So I'm going to let you off the hook on the corners. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. you're the only one who gets that. I, I'm the only one? All yeah, right. you're the only All one. Right. Check. You get to go That's first. that. Okay, Leah, you. Okay, um, four corners. So um, this is a mixed use neighborhood. There are going to be some big <laughs> things on the corners and some things that are much more on the personal scale. Um, it, on one of the corners, there's, a, there's the biggest skyscraper you've ever seen, and, and it, it represents the grand challenges facing the world. I mean, these are grand challenges that um, have to do with um, the people on the planet, the health of the planet, the quality of life, um, security, privacy, um, sustainable energy, and, and also the quality of life um, in you know how we learn and the joy of discovery and these have these have actually been identified they're they're sometimes called the engineering grand challenges but and they were they were developed by the National Academy of Engineering um, as the millennium was turning to say these are areas where the solutions to the problems of food water health environment um, and discovery this is we can do will yeah. engineering will play a major role. Right. But the problems are about humanity, and they will never actually be addressed or tackled unless they live at that intersection. So there, there, there's one corner that just simply talks about the aspirations of, of what role we play together in, in our future. Um, there, there's another corner which, for some reason in my mind, is diagonally across, and I don't know why that is, um, <laughs> is, is actually the, um, the political map of the world, which is absolutely traditionally the domain of the liberal arts. But there's always been a role of technology in, in how that map evolves, but I think now more than ever, um, you know, there, we never used to talk about cyber terrorism and cyber war, and by the same token, we never used to be able to watch YouTube videos of social injustices, no matter where they happened in the world. And so somehow the, the technology, I think, is changing how we think about this political world that we live in. Um, and then the other two corners are far more personal, and, and, I, and I'm gonna, I think about them from a, a, a very academic point of view. There, there are students in our faculty, and on one corner there are the, the, the liberal arts students and faculty who are artists and writers and historians and philosophers, um, whom I think the opportunity is to say, how, how is what they do and can do um, enriched, transformed, affected by changes in technology? You know, can you create something in those domains that didn't exist because the technology's there? And, and the diagonal one is, is clearly the one where I feel most comfortable, which are the engineering students and faculty, who we always know have technical skills, but we really hope that they will be 
articulate communicators and understand not only the technologies they're working on, but the, the global context, the political context, the societal context, all of those other things that will go into making the solutions worthwhile. And the one last thing, and this is something I saw for the first time in Tokyo many, many years ago, which are intersections where all the traffic stops, but the pedestrians get to cross on the diagonals. <laughs> We can do this in West Lafayette at the corner of Northwestern and Stadium. <laughs> and you can cross any way you want. And that, that's the that's intersection. Good Only works. Yeah. <laughs> Jackie. Well, you do know how hard it is for liberal arts people to follow the rules, right? That's right. We're always wanting to redesign things. So. <laughs> I didn't know. Um, I thought you guys made the rules. Um, well, yeah. we make them for other people. <laughs> 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 so I, we're, we're I just dumb engineers. We just follow them. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can't help but say that um, I don't like the corners thing. I'd rather have a circle. There you go. You know, and I want my circle to be pretty big. And I would want some smart kids of whatever age. You know, I think of everybody's kids these days since I'm really on the downside of the hill. But some kids <laughs> uh, in the circle. And I would want to say, we've got a few problems in the world, you know. We've got some problems with food and health. We've got some problems with energy and environment. We've got some problems with peace and security. We've got some problems with the economic uh, system. What do you think's going on there? Go at it. And then I'd at some point want them to turn to thinking very imaginatively about, OK, so what do you think we might do next to try to address these issues? And I wouldn't think of uh, particular people that have already made their marks, because I really believe, given the people that I'm surrounded by every day, that the people that are around me are the people who are going to solve the problems. So I just put them in there and say, go for it. We need you to fix it. <laughs> and I believe that good things would come out of that process. Great. Well, as I've say, as a mathematician and an engineer, you actually got all the four corners. So Jackie had just taught you something about, I did give you the answer. It was a big circle. <laughs> <laughs> really out next time. Okay. The, um, uh, first, off, I want to start this by saying I absolutely love engineers, and I love scientists, and I love science. And that's why I uh -oh. majored. Uh-oh. That's why I majored in English. <laughs> it's true. So my, my four corners were, at first I started with Da Vinci. I think, you know, you have to go pretty far back. I'm sure we could all go a lot farther back. But I, I did actually, despite being an English major, I followed the rules. And uh, Da Vinci was my first choice, and he goes back to the Renaissance. When I think of uh, the liberal arts and, and, uh, and the sciences or STEM, I really do think he's the ultimate embodiment. I suspect every engineering student so, sort of has in the back of their mind that, that that uh, Da Vinci's a hero, and every liberal arts student has in the back of their mind that the Da Vinci's a hero. So, uh, and they both own them. The second one, uh, the second corner is owned by none other than the uh, the obvious choice of Steve Jobs. Yeah, you know, I, I actually just bought a picture at a deep discount because I'm also very price focused. Um, <laughs> of of uh, on one, two pictures actually, one has Steve Jobs uh, when he's 22, and one has Andy Warhol when he's 22. And the Steve Jobs has the word art written across it, and the Andy Warhol has the word business written across it. And I think you know Steve Jobs is just the embodiment of this. The, the third choice, um, the third choice I had was uh, none other than Zaha Hadid. I don't know how many people know who that is, but she's an architect, and you have to do what she does. You have to be such an incredible engineer because to construct a building, and if you go back and Google one of her buildings, you'll see it. They're so complex and so difficult. Um, on the other hand, they're so beautiful. They're really works of art. I mean, each one is a piece of art that uh, I think she's a good embodiment. And my last choice is completely different than the first three. How many people have read the book Thinking Fast and Slow? Just raise your hand. Not enough. Or Daniel Ariely's uh, Predictably Irrational. These are books written by social scientists um, about how humans really think and the biases we have. And it's a good example, I think, of where somebody who grew up in the social sciences is actually attacking things that an engineer normally would, but it has, happens to be on a human uh, behavioral front. He, he points out all the flaws in our thinking, uh, the, the, our natural desire to be affirmed when we have an idea instead of find somebody who disagrees with us. So those are my four corners. 
Well, you know, it's funny. I usually make up the questions and I don't answer them. It's kind of, you know, that's the only good news about my job. <laughs> and, uh, but I thought it was like, this was really a, a, an interesting question for me because I kept working on what the question ought to be. And I have noticed in the past that if you insert something, you know, we, we have the, at the intersection of liberal arts and STEM, doesn't actually mean a real intersection. But whenever you inter, I, I enter into this, we'll try to put it in a physical space, the answers change. It like integrates your your um, uh, your 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 head or your brain, if you will. And so for me, it was uh, in one corner. I started with Sister Lorinda, who was my freshman English teacher in high school, <laughs> and she was a battle axe. I'm telling you, Sister Lorinda would say, "You spell one right word wrong. You have one sentence wrong. That's a fragment, which apparently is a mortal sin, according to her. <laughs> um, you a fragment. You start out with a C." You know, and I was like, oh, you know, we were 13 or 14, you know, okay. And so, man, she just was at us, you know. And she really was at us about how do you write and what do you write and, and how do you do it and you will do it. And, you know, darn it if we all didn't. One of my classmates is uh, the uh, famous British novelist Elizabeth George. And she says, it was Sister Lorinda. <laughs> how was it, man? You know, we used to say, uh, later we'd say she didn't care about content. She just cared to get the structure right. You know, so that, somebody else was in charge of that. And so then I go to the next corner, and I got right here at Purdue. And my major professor was uh, Dick Garrett over in mechanical engineering. And, and um, here he had all of these all of these students, you know, and here I was, and I wanted to get out and get back to California, but they were kind of all ahead of me, and, and I said, I want to graduate in June, and this is like in November, and he goes, I got to tell you, Mary, we got, I got way too many students who can't graduate in June, and he goes, how about August, or how about next December, you know, and I'm like, eh, I'm leaving town, you know, and so I said, how about this, I'll just write you a table of contents, chapter one, chapter two, you know, kind of get it on, and, and then we can kind of go from there. And he, and he kind of stares at me, but I don't think anything of it. And then uh, I come back a couple weeks later, and that's exactly what I gave him. I handed it to him in his office in a, in a, fold, in a manila folder. And, uh, uh, and I went downstairs to the ME lab, uh, which I checked is still there. Everybody's tearing up everything on this campus, Mitch. You know, I got a few complaints. Some of my normal paths across campus have been messed with. You know, so at any rate, I'm now getting old and crotchety. It's, it's going to get torn up. Oh, oh my God. So anyway, I go to into the old, in the old, and to be better. Okay, so go I go over and grab a brick. I be, yeah, I need a brick. Yeah. So anyway, so I'm, I go, I'm sitting in there, and in comes uh, Garrett, and he's got this thing under his arm, and he's storming into the lab, and we all go, <gasps> and I notice what's under his arm, and I'm like. Okay, that's it. I'm never getting a PhD. I mean, that's it. And he puts this thing down in front of me, and he opens it, and he opens up the papers, and he goes, look at this. And I said, what's that? And he goes, that's a sentence. That's a paragraph. It refers to a figure, which is right here, and it's correctly placed here, and here are the page numbers. You can graduate any time you want. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out he was writing the dissertations of all the graduate students. So once you had the right amount of work done, and it was correct, then he had to kind of help you over the hill, and he literally had to almost write these things. And of course, at that time, you could go through to get a PhD in engineering, and never take a single English course. Now that just, so he's on the second corner. Right now, he's going, yeah, yeah. I could use some help. <laughs> and so then, of course, I go to the next corner, and who's there? Leonardo da Vinci. You know, you don't care who you are, you study him. I study him. I still do interviews on him. Oh, his secret little notes. Oh, let's do an interview. You know, so it's like, he saw so many things. He didn't see different subjects. It was all one big thing. And his science is still good today. His engineering is so good today. And what he wrote is so great. And his, his art, and oh, I mean, it's just incredible. So he's on the fourth one. And then it's like, OK, in the art. And then I go to this corner. And this corner is kind of interesting, because I put Biz Stone on here. Biz Stone is one of the founders of Twitter. And I was like, what's he doing here? Well, he's an artist. That's where he started. So you ask him the share price of Twitter, he goes, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> and now he's on to something new, jelly. And it's like, and I just see Sister Lorinda standing there and go, and I have new rules for 160 characters. <laughs> and you'd better follow them. And you'd go, oh yeah, oh yeah, Sister Lorinda, because he would not argue with her either. And so, at any rate, for me, there's this big circle of people that all make up everything we do. And they, they fit in absolutely what everybody is seeing. But it's in, in many ways, I feel like the intersection of, of arts and sciences are 
not just perspectives, but, but almost like different spatial visualizations that all have to mesh into the same place and come out of the same place. So here's my next, my next question for you is, um, where do you see yourself? I mean, uh, Leah has actually says, well, I really see myself as, uh, uh, you know, sort of standing squarely in engineering. When you're looking at somebody on the other side, you know, that would be in, you know, liberal arts, what, where do they miss the point from your perspective? And where do you see your own people, your own peeps, where do they miss the point? Who wants to start first? No, start Leah? Sure. Um, so the problem is, I'm just going to say this. Um, if I'm talking to Bud, he never misses the point. So this is a really There's hard question to ask. So um, I'm just going to, you know, so, so, so I have to visualize. So, um, you know, I think for, um, I'll, I'll do the less risky and talk about where I think the engineers missed the point. I, I, you okay. know, I actually, I think it is still, I think it is less than it used to be, but I think we still have a lot of students studying engineering because they think that they're going to get to do math and build things all day long. And the fact that they don't like writing and um, are afraid of public speaking and, you know, they're, they're not really sure about any of this other stuff, that engineering is a great home for them. And um, it's changing. I mean, it really is changing, and there's been a lot of work that's been done in sort of the public imaging. Um, there's a report called Changing the Conversation, um, Improving the Public Understanding of Engineering, which, which really basically sort of beats us all over the head and says, well, you just stop talking about the math and science and talk about what you do and the impact it has in the world. Yeah. So I actually... Um, on my car for the only time in my life, have a, it's magnetic so I can take it off when I want, but it's a bumper sticker. And, and it says, because dreams need doing. And it's, you know, this is actually an engineering, it says, you know, engineeringchallenges.org. Um, um, and, and so I think that the, the st we let the stereotypes still um, play a little too big a role in, um, in, in thinking about, you know, what do we need to be good at? Yeah. Um, I think. Let me, let me just say here also, when you say you missed the point, it's not a criticism. It says, it's, it's, it's like this tells you something about the speaker. A lot of times when I'm asking, or like some of the stuff we cut out, I go, I'm going to ask you a question, but I think you need to understand, uh, maybe we need to change this question, or you'll, you'll get where I'm missing it, and we'll re, we, it, it informs you both directions, you know. Uh -huh. uh, on the other side, um, I, I'm actually going to borrow from um, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, who is, is quite outspoken about um, how you can go to a cocktail party and you're talking to people and what do you do and, and you know, well, I'm, 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 a, I'm a scientist, I'm an engineer and I'm like, well, I'm, I'm an author and, 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 but then the response will be, well, but I don't do math. And that's a pretty acceptable answer in the world. You but it shouldn't say, be. So you're a biologist? There's a missing, there's a missing symmetry, you know, that, that, that for me, even as an engineer, to say, well, I don't do words. Um, that's, that's a good that, that doesn't, that's, that's a little hollow quite, for you. But the, I don't but do it's math. It's real. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm looking at Vera Weiser, who, you know, <laughs> taught my daughter math. <laughs> um, the, the, but, but that's the I don't real. do math is somehow yeah. still an OK way of thinking about things. But if you actually look at the world we live in, and it, you know, there's, all, there's always been math, but now there's technology, and it's really pretty hard for, for you not to be engaged with that technology somehow. But just taking it as a given without trying to understand anything about it, well, um, also when it's part of the solution a problem. is that to see what's a good solution and a bad solution. Part of that requires a little math. It's a little difficult to have the conversation. Yeah. And so that, that's where the, one of the stumbling blocks. Who's, who's next? Who wants to leap in there? Bracken, go ahead. And then uh, Jeff. You know, I, 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 I would probably give kind of the same, in the same vein. I, you know, if I were talking to uh, the STEM students, I'd say, you know, do you want to be the machine or do you want to be the result? And I think, you know, if you, if you do nothing but become an engineer who 
you know, follows the scientific method or the scientists and you, and you follow A plus B plus C plus D, you, you are part of the machine and you're making a big difference in the world and it's really exciting. But the world we're headed into isn't that world. It's a world where there are machines that do that. We're gonna be in a world where we're all gonna be creatives. And I'd say, if I were in the STEM fields today, I'd wanna be uh, augmenting my skill set with, with things that will make me more creative, which doesn't mean that, no offense to all of us liberal arts majors, that we're all creative. But certainly having experience across a wider range of discipline, disciplines, a wider range of experiences, a wider range of subjects, simply gives you more analogies to compare things, to, to, to apply to new things. And I think that is the definition of, or it's one of the definitions of IQ, it's another definition of creativity. The ability to take things and apply them, and, and apply analogies that don't seem to belong there. So I think that's, I would say, you know, gosh, if you want to be a, it, you know, if you want to be a doer, maybe the, the last hundred years a doer could be a, a nothing but an engineer. But I think in the next 50 years, the doers have to be doers and dreamers and, and analogists, or if that's even a word. Check. So the, 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 the waters I swim in every day in my job, I'm, I'm privileged to be able to work with both designers and engineers. Uh, so creative designers, graphic designers, industrial designers, interaction designers, and, and engineers. And it's, it's interesting, I've uh, coined a term that we use at, at Newell, I, I, I've I called them uh, otters and beavers. Um, the otters are the, uh, the, the designers that um, have a, um, a, a very um, uh, almost playful way of problem solving. Uh, they will, they will uh, you know, cobble things together, cobble little models together that uh, are actually working through visually uh, problem solving. And then you've got the engineers that, that um, you know, by and large, you know, really like to um, kind of think about a problem, solve a problem, they'll just beaver away at it until they, uh, they land on a solution. And where I found that the, um, the magic really occurs is when you can get both sides past their language. So, um, you know, so if you can so get... You're, stuck and you, you're missing the point because you you, you're speaking English, I'm speaking French. Exactly, exactly. And, and where I spend probably the majority of my time is trying to act as, as translator between these two groups because they both are on to very creative solutions to maybe the same problem, but they're just sort of talking past each other because you know, perhaps an, uh, an, you know, uh, the engineering team might be using mathematics or, or technical terms that are just you know, beyond the, the, uh, the, the, the training uh, of, of the design team. The designers may be using terminologies about surface and form and things that um, you know, the engineers are, are sort of struggling to grasp. So, you know, at, at this notion of finding common language and common ground between these two disciplines, uh, to my mind, is one where you begin to unlock this potential that, that Bracken was describing in terms of really uh, being able to solve problems that uh, are here today and the problems that will be here tomorrow. Well, I'm just lo loving the look on Jackie's face. Talk to us, girl. <laughs> well, the, the difficulty that I'm having here is that when I answer the question for myself, my tendency to, is to say I stand with the humans. Okay? And in saying that, it seems to me that as human beings, we have the capacity to go beyond our uh, predispositions. And so some of us have talents and abilities. Some of us have habits. And uh, those habits can be uh, a pretty broad range of things. We don't all have to be alike. The question is, how do we learn? And I think we all have to learn to talk with each other. How do we learn to engage with each other? So it's not just what do we miss? Why do we get it? You know, we work at it to get it. Uh, so just as our not working at it gives all this opportunity for missing the point, if you know that there is the potential for missing the point, then do you have the commitment to work on getting the point? And I think that's what ties into what you were saying. The other thing that, that strikes me about all of this is that uh, human beings have the habit as if I were going to give a name last time, it would have been Octavia Butler. Does anybody know her? Yeah. She's my heroine. 
because one of, the, one of the things that she said that lingers with me is that the problem with human beings is that we're both intelligent and hierarchical. If we were one or the other, we wouldn't have the problem, but we're both. And so part of the problem of having the dichotomies with science and other, or with liberal arts and other, is that we assume that that's natural. And I don't think there's anything natural at all about it. I think we make it up. And so the, the point that, to me, is the important point is that we have to commit to crossing whatever divides are created by our predispositions or our habits or our inclinations or whatever it is so that we can get to being what I would prefer to be, and that is more human uh, in our interactions with each other. So I don't necessarily see that just because you're a scientist or you work with scientists that there's something weird about you and I don't have to listen or pay attention or try to understand or vice versa. Yeah. We know it's it's really very interesting. Uh, my colleague Professor Lorton and I, um, it it all started when I started this business, a biotech program, and and that business has like twelve major disciplines, one of which is science. So you start and end with science, and then oh, you got everything. You got uh, venture capital, and you got uh, bioenterprise law, and you've got uh, it just goes on and on. You know, intellectual property, and you got multinational expertise and bioethics and social considerations and media and information. So you got all these expertises, most of whom don't even talk to each other. But you need all of them to make it work. So if we take that analogy here, uh, what we did then is we had people say, I don't do science. I hate science. And it's like, turned out they had a math anxiety. They didn't do physics and chemistry. Oh, biology. Easy, you know. Or we had people who, you know, you can't do science today, as you could 30 years ago, without being deeply embedded in technology. And 15% of people are very technophobic. So does that mean you can't be a scientist? What does that mean? You know, and so our test, I mean, I think what's relevant here is to see people could have, people who were technologists could actually like science better without the technology. With the science. It's like, wait a minute, and we got people with math anxiety, we got, and it's like, no, they can't get over their anxiety. They are who they are, you know. But if we can get an appreciation for, you know, I, knowing yourself, saying, well, I don't do this, I don't, I don't do heart surgery, I can still, you know, and it's like, I cook, other people don't, you know, but I can appreciate you gotta cook, you know, and so you can do these things. It's like how we figure out, if you don't see what all the elements are of the problems you're trying to solve, then you only see your elements. So to your point, Jackie, it's like, hey, we're all, we're all humans, and, and to being on the engineering side, because we like to be a little more analytical, can't, can't we put them all in boxes? We have a lot of boxes, and it's like, well, can we put 20 kind of different skills that go out here, 20 kind of knowledges or experiences that might go into a solution like you have to ask everybody who's going to be affected? Well, engineers, we don't say, no, 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 we build it and then we plug it in and we say, somebody's going to buy it. You know, so, whoa, 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 wait a minute, that's not how it works. Now, some of the liberal arts has that sensitivity right up front. You know, ethics as an example of something. So as a, it's almost like the conversation here. Now, there's a question here. Now, uh, for those of you who haven't noticed, if you want to tweet your, your questions here to uh, at libarts.com, uh, it'll come out here. Public, sorry, Purdue uh, LibArts uh, is here. I suddenly just decided to make it a website. And, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, was, I was lost in thought here. So there we have it. But, uh, but they'll be bringing the questions out to me. Here's something um, I think is a really interesting question. It's like if we're, if we're so interested in combining liberal arts and STEM, what's the one elective every student should take? So that means that's a new elective. That's not one that we have from the old days. What would that look like? Bracken. You know, I, I actually, uh, I, to Jackie's point, I, I think this, this idea that, you know, if you really, this is just a personal view, of course, but it seems like we've kind of gotten here uh, walking backwards into the future. You know, we're, we're now talking about STEM versus liberal arts, not becoming a, a, a better, more productive person, which is kind of an odd thought. So, so we're, but we've got these groupings now. So, you know, I, when I walk into bookstores, I, I'm, I'm always struck by how many books there, self-help books there are about getting things done, goal setting, you know, everything you can think of. But there's no college, I don't remember, a, a, at least there wasn't on my, in my college, there wasn't a class on, on getting things done. How do you get things done? I think engineering people learn that more. Engineering, the STEM sciences often get that, learn that better because of the process. But 
You know, and, and that's one of those, for all you liberal arts majors out there, learn to get things done. Learn to set goals, learn to accomplish them, learn to set milestones. If you don't, your life won't be nearly as rich and as good. So I think something on how do you set goals, how do you set milestones, how do you get things done? Maybe this was the domain of religion you know, 30 years ago and it's gone now, but it just seems like a whole. Well, it's almost like if you have a team, team classes where you keep putting people together from all the different things and you guys gotta get things done together, <laughs> and there are many different aspects to it. Maybe that's part of the learning to, to actually very specifically design to do that, something like that, something along those lines. Um, where is the poet's place in STEM? On the computer? I don't know. <laughs> I think if you ask most people in engineering what a poet is, I don't think they would get what a poet is. Well, I find that a really interesting pers uh, question because at Georgia Tech we have two chairs in poetry. And we have very lively poetry readings uh, six, seven times a year. Um, and the people who attend those sessions are students who are engineers. So I think it is to me, an understanding of the way that ex expressivity operates in a life and understanding that there are uh, different le levels of expertise about what it means to be a poet, but there's not something foreign about the role of poetry in your life. So you can appreciate words well used. You can ap appreciate emotions well expressed. You can appreciate experiences well rendered uh, and know that that is the poetic in us. And some people are really very good at that and that we want to enjoy them as they are. But we also know that we all have the human capacity to participate in that expressive process and that the thing about being in the company of poets is helping you to understand those kinds of human connections. You can be an engineer and still like poetry. You know, you said a, a, a two terms there that we don't usually use. One we always use in engineering called communications. You got this idea, you got to communicate it over here so everybody gets it. We don't generally say express. Express is sometimes it's your internal state, it's your idea. You're just expressing it, and that's a process of many different things that we frequently don't focus on. Bracken, you had something to contribute well, I, here. I, just, I, I was going to oversimplify this to a, an embarrassingly, uh, an embarrassing degree, probably. But when I think of poetry, I think of a verbal and visual beauty. It's economical. It's aesthetically attractive. It just appeals to you, and I think that's true of everybody who's studying STEM, and it's true of every, it's true of every human being. And I think. You know, if you're, Bill, if you're an, uh, an engineer and you're creating a, a software program, there's poetry in that if you do it incredibly beautifully well. And so I think that's, to me, poetry, if you, if you, if you simplify it to those terms, to me it works very well in STEM. The poetry of physics, the poetry of engineering. You know, I, you know, I think poetry does many things, and, and there are many different kinds of poetry, and they really do do different things, but I think um, some of the things that poetry can do is, um, is invite you to look at a world that is different than the one that you normally look at. And it, it can be a, a microcosm, it can be a grand world, but it, but, and, and sometimes it challenges you to look at things differently, to, to try to use the words to in your own mind, create this picture, this world, this whatever it is that the poet is, is describing. And that it, for STEM and engineering to really be as effective as they should be, and, and, and in particular for scientists and engineers, I think this ability to um, see the world through different lenses 
to, to be able to put yourself in the minds of someone else, in the experience of someone else, which is really, in many cases, what poetry is inviting you to do. Um, and if you don't have the, that ability, then it limits you as an engineer. And, and yet, to the extent that poetry can actually be one of the really exquisite ways of, of improving that ability, um, it's, it's incredibly valuable. It's almost like everyone's searching in their own field. How do we, how do we get out to all the others? How do we, how do we integrate it? I think there's something very basic uh, about that point. You know, it's about what kind of eye you have, what kind of heart you have, what kind of imagination and mind you have, even what kind of backbone do you have, what, what are you willing to see in the world. But the question that keeps coming back to me, especially with people who are scientists or engineers, uh, or computer people, or things that are um, of a technological world in whatever way, is that, is that all that you are? No. I don't believe that about anybody I know, and I know a lot of engineers these days. Is that all that you are? And so. They wouldn't buy a widget unless they looked at 10,000 and they'd, they'd marry the first girl through the door. <laughs> <He'd be> like, <laughs> you need a little help, buddy. I don't know what to say. <laughs> so the, if, if there is an exposure to poetry in these systematic ways and the implication is through a curriculum, then does that give a student who is not in the habit of seeing or thinking or feeling or expressing in these alternative ways the opportunity to stretch the mind, the imagination, the viewpoint, the, the uh, ability to perceive through something that is beyond the typical habit that he or she has. And you know, I think it developed. can go in the other way as well. I was working with some academics recently and they kept talking about this paper and that, that these people had all these hypotheses and then it turned out this and everything. And I'm reading this paper and I'm reading this paper and I finally said, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to kill a tree. We gotta, we gotta print out the 39 page paper. I, I'm just, I'm lost. And I sat down and on one piece of paper, just like this, on one side there were like six bubbles and the hypotheses didn't go one to the other. I kind of made this thing, you know, okay, this is asking about this, this says this had this, okay, and then, in the end of the day, all the science, and then it all up, and it's like, and actually only four things came out. And I said, okay, here's where we start, and here's the, and everybody in the whole room said, oh! <laughs> They've been talking about it for two days, you know? And so, an engineer can come in with it, just saying, I just gotta put it down on a piece of paper with some arrows and circles, that actually, isn't there personally, it ends up contributing to the whole. So it's like, I think that we, if we can find some of these places, Absolutely. I think it's, it's really interesting. You're now, talking th about symbolic systems. Yeah. I mean, and uh, the way that poets use language is one symbolic system. The way that mathematicians use numbers and physicists use formula of various kinds, those are other symbolic systems. Why not have uh, uh, the capacity to use more than one system? Right. Right, multiple languages of many different varieties. Exactly. In a thousand years, will Steve Jobs still be talked about the way you all are, I guess it's from the South, the racist, y'all are talking about Da Vinci tonight. Will Jobs still matter, and what will he be remembered for? I guess that was an if so in there, y'all. That's, that's a great question. That's a and so, question. so if I, and I, I guess I would say yes, but not because of, a thousand years from now, it will not be all carrying iPhones. I mean, there will be more to it than that. It's not going to be. Uh, you know, I, I guess I would say because um, it, engineering, I think, is a lot of times accused of, you know, just building something and saying, well, we're going to build this and, um, you know, we're going to go out and ask the customers, which is always considered good practice. You know, ask the customers, figure out what they need, build something to the needs. But, but I think what Jobs did is this intersection, which says, no, imagine a different future. Make that happen. And people will realize that, wow, that's a really good future. I want that future. And, and that fundamental principle is just so much, so tightly associated with him. Um, I mean, the only situation I could see where he wouldn't be remembered would be if that's the way of life of everything, then it's not special anymore, but it's, it's special. Right. Yeah. 
Andy Bragg, yeah, I, Bragg and I would say, I mean, just a, I think if you said, well, what was so special about Leonardo da Vinci? Yeah, he, he represented two or three people, Raphael, Michelangelo. They, they were the, the ultimate expression of creators of that time. And it was such a sea change in creativity between the, you know, the period right before them and the period when they created. They just reinvented what art was, what science was. And I think uh, Steve Jobs, it, he won't be remembered because he's Steve Jobs. He'll be remembered because he represents Larry Page and Sergey Brin and the guy who invented Twitter and this whole generation of people who are changing the world. Now maybe we're too close to it. Maybe we're overstating the importance of this moment. But boy, to somebody who's lived in Europe and now living in Silicon Valley, it feels like that big a deal to me. And Steve Jobs is the, is the ultimate embodiment of what's happening right now. For me, the, the, the thing that I, I hope in a thousand years that Steve Jobs is remembered for is um, his, his ability to stick to a principle uh, through to, to execution, as, as Brackett had talked about a couple of times earlier. I mean, when we talk about you know, traditional uh, product creation, product development, it is all around um, sampling customers, trying to understand needs, et cetera, et cetera. What I've always admired about uh, Jobs' approach was, uh, it was it was driven by this blend of great technology, great, great liberal arts coming together but with a very strong vision of what the future could be and should be, and not necessarily market research to death. So for me, uh, that courage, because at the time when Apple was uh, you know, just getting launched and just coming into its, uh, into its own, um, you know, that was a, an incredibly brave thing to do. And um, so at least for me, if, if a thousand years from now, if he's remembered for anything, I hope he's remembered for that. I think that the question is not a thousand years ago versus a thousand years in the future with these two men. I think it is what characteristics and qualities do they share as people who have made differences in their world that we can admire. And what I see is the quality of their mind, their imagination. They, they both exhibited such amazing ability to imagine things, to imagine possibility for their time. And they also, and whether it's Jobs or Da Vinci, you're talking about people who, who were able to not just use their tools well, but to create the tools that they needed to do what they wanted to do. So they were able to externalize that imagination in this magnificent way that people were compelled by. And so whether we ever remember uh, Jobs' name a thousand years from now, or even if people forget Leonardo's name a thousand years from now, we still want people in the world who have that kind of intensity of about what it means to be imaginative in the world and what it means to externalize that with tools, with creativity, to really kind of uh, bend the universe in the ways that will make a difference in the quality of, of, of lives. You know, I, I don't know if we will remember him for a thousand years, but we're going to remember him for a good long time. And it's got nothing to do with any of the specific technologies, to my mind. I was, you know, market research is the, is the whole thing. It was, it was listed a lot of times here. Um, Hewlett Packard got a whole bunch of focus groups together and said, hey, do you think you need a, a color printer? And everybody went, ah. Yeah, we don't need I don't need no color printers here. You know, so it's like well so much for that because it saved their shorts as we used to say. Um, and I think the greatest thing is that jobs gave voice to the true nature of innovation when um, somebody was saying to focus groups or in my case somebody said to me, Well we'll just see if anybody comes in and has asked for that. And Jobs said, How will they know what we want until we show it to them? And so that's the true nature of innovation. It's there's a daring, there's original thought, and um, and it, and it fails when you're in life, if you haven't really considered all the possible pieces and all the possible things. It doesn't really exist in one person. But these people have capabilities that are beyond just a few things. They're very, very expanded. Um, of course, we got the, uh, the standard, I'm looking for a job right now. How do I take this conversation to market? <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, 
should he, met, should he or she mention this in the marketplace? Will it be not understood by, will it be understood at Newell Rubbermaid if they come in saying, oh man, I'm really into liberal arts and It'll help. STEM? I mean, it's a, it's a place in to start. In your place it will, all right. <laughs> it's a place to start. No, I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that we look for, um, um, you know, I've had this, had this conversation uh, a number of times this evening is, um, um, you know, just superlative problem solvers. And so typically it's the, the, the folks that can embrace both sides that, uh, you know, do have a leg up. So sure, absolutely, give me a call. And we like to say it ain't a problem until we say it's a problem. And so, and all the problems are solved. And so there are people in many different, that have to shout out and say, hey, I have a problem that you couldn't see if you weren't there and couldn't see it in the way people were saying it. I have a response. Uh, I think that one of the reasons for a panel like this is to really understand that operating at the intersections of our disciplines that we're talking about here gives you a flexibility. Uh, it it uh, really trains you to figure out how to get work done. It really helps you to figure out how to get work done in ways that are uh, problems focused, uh, that are um, ex an exhibition of cross thinking. You know, you're not just standing in one spot, you have the capacity to, to look across um, uh, the inquiry needs in a way so that you can solve, the, solve problems. And if you come with the skills that we bring as, as people in the liberal arts as well, you have the capacity to interact with others. Sometimes others that you don't know personally. Uh, so all of those things are really very usable in a job search situation. And because of your well-formed question, I believe you will be employed. And. Uh, <laughs> I want you to remember that early on, all things being equal, the three important things on the, your first job is please your boss, please your boss, and please your boss. Let's get you ahead really, really fast. Um, I think one of the things that uh, used to be big in, in colleges is you used to have to take a foreign language. And you used to have to do a set of things that were considered good, but it was a time when there weren't languages all over the place, and there weren't a hundred zillion channels, and there wasn't YouTube, and people literally didn't fly a lot of places. Rita Caldwell, who was the first female head of the National Science Foundation, went to Purdue, and she had received a letter from Purdue offering her a full scholarship. She had gotten into Radcliffe, but they had given her just a partial one. And so, but Purdue gave her a full one, and it's like, you know, this is how you get your women in those days, you buy them. I got a full scholarship. I came. <laughs> Other people didn't. I came. And so she got literally was in, it wasn't that long ago. She, was, she lived in Boston. She got on a train and came all the way across and arrived in, in Lafayette, you know, right out here. And it's like, oh, here I am at Purdue. You know, it was like, she said it was like going to the moon. You know, so where are we? You know, do we have a role? Yeah, okay, so sometimes it feels that way too. Yeah. So anyway, so where are we now in this? Let's, let's just get out and stop. We're, right now we're looking at each other, you know, our liberal arts, your STEM, how do we put this together? Let's look outside that. What do we need to do in terms of travel? What, what should we have our students do in terms of travel, in terms of speaking languages, in terms of in, in, immersing themselves in the world? What kind of experiences? might bring that together. I was, I was going to say, let me take a run at it. I mean, I think, you know, from my side, one of the, uh, the things that um, uh, very early in my career, and uh, at the time it, it just scared the crap out of me, but um, I was given the opportunity when I was at Xerox to uh, move to Japan. So didn't know a soul, you know, didn't know the language, and, um, and I thought, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to give this a whack. And, uh, so uh, actually I lived in Japan for three years, worked at, at, at Fuji Xerox, and uh, when I reflect back on that period, um, that I think was when I came into my own uh, in terms of, uh, um, you know, as a, as a business leader, as a product development expert, um, I learned more, um, not just during the, the nine to five job, but outside of work, you know, just in terms of, of, of learning a new culture, learning a new language, learning uh, new capabilities. And, um, 
you know, it, it's one of the things that, um, you know, certainly as I, as I mentor uh, students today, one of the things that I try to encourage them to do is to um, immerse themselves into as many cultures as they possibly can because certainly uh, what I've seen change in my career is literally developing products and solutions for a given market. You know, it could be the U.S. or you know, it could be Japan, whatever it might be, but it's sort of a mono-market uh, uh, approach. Today, uh, everything that we do at, uh, at my company has salience in, in, in multiple regions. And uh, so, you know, I, I think in many ways, um, you know, take those leaps of faith and uh, really, um, uh, as early as possible, grab a hold of those kinds of opportunities. Two, two very specific things. One, um, I... In, the, in January, February, um, did a series of receptions where we invited um, Purdue engineering alums and also high school seniors who'd been admitted to Purdue to, to let them meet each other and let the, let the students and their families meet some real alums and, and vice versa. And um, I, didn't, I never actually went out of my way to talk about international experiences because I knew somebody would always ask. And so I would ask the alums there, you know, in the course of your career, how many of you spent some part of your career um, globally, internationally? And, and at least half, sometimes two thirds or three quarters, depending on where we are, would raise their hands and do that. And, and then it was just great to tell the students to, to go talk to them about why this is important. Um, and so in a way, we act as if this is new and, and it's, you know, it's important. Our students need international experiences, but actually, our, our alums have been practicing it for a long time. I will, I will just put in a plug that um, in fall, um, recruiting will start for the first class of um, students who want to do a double major in mechanical engineering and Spanish or mechanical engineering and German. Um, and it is a four and a half year major, two degrees, um, clearly focused on you know coursework in both disciplines, but also a domestic internship, an international internship, um, study abroad components, and and we're just excited that um, that the, the the different departments are working together to do this. Okay, we haven't talked about minorities, women, or the economically disadvantaged. Anybody want to jump in? <laughs> I would say we have talked about them. We've talked about the fact that at least. You know, for a lot of what any of us are trying to do is address problems of humanity. And well, your ethics program, you might describe that, because that, that actually brought a lot of women into uh, engineering. Yeah, so for engineering, um, one of the most successful um, approaches to getting um, more girls, more high school, middle school girls interested in engineering and more college students, female college students, has been going back to this messaging, don't talk about the math and science, talk about how this works with real people solving real problems. So the, so the and, and so actually this would be the, my answer to your question, if, if one course that if yeah. you were gonna have the intersection, I would be completely self-serving and say it should be EPICS. Um, and EPICS was founded at Purdue. It, when it was founded, it stood for engineering projects in community service. It's saying connect the, the technology with the community needs. Um, if you look around now, you'll very rarely see that spelled out because the, the realization after about the first year was that th there really was a goal to say the projects have an engineering core. You're trying to use engineering to solve problems, but it's solving problems for people and for the community and a bunch of engineers actually working together do that very badly. Um, and so you'd be far better off recruiting students from all over the campus. So this, about 25% of the students in EPICS this year are from um, outside engineering, and they're from 45 different majors at Purdue. Um, and in, in particular, the percent of women, both from outside engineering, but in, in our, my self-interest in having more women in engineering, yeah, much higher percent. It's a way of saying, this is a caring profession, it is a human profession, you get to use these, these, get, these tools and things, but the tools aren't the point. The point is, what are you doing and who's it helping? Well, we're definitely seeing a value change out of the millennials. 
They want to help people. They see value in service to the world. They see value in service to each other. And so maybe some of the international global immersion should be just to the poor within 100 miles of here. <laughs> so, wait a minute. There's a whole lot of other people here that are, that are going on to understand that you're, I always say when you're designing anything, remember 7 billion number subject to change. You're designing it hopefully for everyone with everyone in mind as to how to do it. Um, I think the question about women, minority, uh, people from other cultures and ethnicities is how it is we really envision the world. I mean, it's not just um, um, what we're thinking about in terms of a particular curriculum or a program. I think that's part of it. But do we see the importance of uh, people um, around the globe living productive lives, of our interacting with them in positive ways, of our seeing ourselves as part of a global community, uh, our seeing a possibility of living in places where we were not born. So the question is uh, for the, your first one uh, about the, the, um, the foreign language courses and connections is that are you in a modern world? Because part of the intersection is about are you comfortable in a science and technological world? Where we're in one, it's going to be getting even more so. We need to help people to be more comfortable with that. We need to help them to be more productive in that space. We need to help them think, about, think more holistically about being in that space. Thinking holistically means also thinking ethically thinking with some kind of social consciousness, thinking with some kind of culturally informed perspective. Uh, and in, in talking about all those things, if you look at how many people around the world are women, well, what do you think they're going to be doing? You know, uh, how are we making some space in our imagination for the fact that some of them might want to be engineers, might need to be engineers, might be just the engineer that we're looking for to solve this problem and that problem and the other problem. Don't you want to make sure that there is the opportunity, not just the, the access to the space, but the opportunity to exercise those talents in a, in a way that allows the world benefit from that? So I think that we have to think systematically about these things, not just as, um, as, um, as saying the right things or uh, engaging in acceptable behavior in a complex world, but recognizing that this is the space that we're talking about here. We're talking about a globe where people don't stay at home, they travel, where you need to know something about all of these things. That's great. And now I'm going to ask for a last, uh, a last word from, from each of our panelists. Chuck, we'll start with you. Uh, so, you know, I, I think the, one of the things when I uh, had, had first been approached about um, Speaking on this panel, uh, again, the, uh, the 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 fact that that literally there is not a day that goes by that I'm not right in the middle of this, um, you know, sort of intersection of of liberal arts and and uh, and STEM. And you know, I think for me, um, uh, right now, uh, you know, there there probably aren't that many people in in the corporate world that have the kind of role and, and job that I have. Um, my, my fond hope and my fond wish is 10 years from now, 20 years from now, uh, the job that I have today is going to be the norm. And, uh, and I believe it will be. Um, I think that uh, this kind of integrative thinking, this whole brain thinking uh, that we've been describing this evening is going to be the way forward. Um, I think it's going to be how the world runs uh, as we move into future generations. And I'm excited about that. And I'm excited to be at this point in time right now where, yes, I can sort of reflect back on, uh, you know, maybe where there wasn't a lot of dialogue about these disciplines coming together, and yet I, I can see forward in terms of what it's going to be like when they do. And uh, that's a great place to be. So um, that's it. Thank you. Leah. Um, so relationships, pretty much of any kind, work best when they're mutual. Um, and so I would say that above all, especially at this point in time, 
where this is a topic of discussion, and, and in, Purdue in particular, we're talking about what does it mean to be a, a world-renowned university for what it does in STEM, but what is the, what is the role of liberal arts? Is, is to make sure that the relationship is mutual. And, and by that I mean that, that for those of us who are in STEM fields to be you know, embracing the liberal arts and for those who are in the liberal arts to be embracing STEM and, and you, know, you just create this vision of this big group hug, which is a good thing. I'll <laughs> have to have a policy on that, Mitch. Group hugs are okay. <laughs> Jackie. I guess the only thing that I would add is a reminder to all of us to uh, remember that universities are very privileged places. And with that privilege comes some obligation for us to think as um, innovatively and creatively as we can about the kind of, um, kind of preparation for the future that we're uh, uh, making for these kids. And I think that part of that preparation includes um, facing the world in which we know that they are, but encouraging them not to be intimidated by the fact that it may change and that they have the imagination, the tools, the, the creativity, the ability to really participate in that with gusto. Reckon. Well, I, I, uh, I guess I, 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 I think in terms of students, I've got three kids who are, uh, two are in college, one's I hope on his way to college. And, uh, and the, uh, you know, if, if for, the, for the STEM majors, I think the, to me, the, the recommendation is pretty easy to take, which is go take more liberal arts, period. It's great that you're doing STEM. You're learning to do something, but go take more liberal arts. It, it, there's a panel up here, but all of us agree, but you know, they pan pick the panel because there, there are a bunch of people up here who agree with this. But I can, I can tell you that leaders throughout the world will tell you the same thing. So this is just an obvious thing for, for a, STEM, a STEM student. For it's harder, now my message is a little tougher for the liberal arts students, and most of you who are students here probably are. Uh, you need to get a practical, alternative if you don't know you're going to teach, you're going to write, or you're going to use that liberal arts degree in a very specialized way that you can walk out the door and get a job. Because you're, you're building something that's really valuable, which is this understanding of uh, humanity, understanding of the, of the arts, understanding. But it might, not, it might take you uh, longer than it should to put it to practical use and to begin to turn your life into something that you're excited about if you don't know where you're going. And so, what I tell my kids is it's great to major in the liberal arts, but get an alternative plan too, unless you know exactly what you're going to do. You know, I've been, I've been up here, and some of the questions that we didn't get to are asking about this. It's like, how do we squeeze this, this combination of liberal arts and STEM into four years in college? It's like, how do we do that? How do we? It's like, oh my God, I can't imagine giving up a whole lot of these courses. I mean, how do you do it? And then I remembered that uh, I went to a Jesuit college. I didn't come to Purdue until I went to graduate school. If you, if you go to a Jesuit college, this is a place where they make you take philosophy and theology, and they let you take math and science. <laughs> so that I became an engineer is a miracle, but they tell you what a miracle is. So I was pretty, <laughs> I was pretty clear on that. And then I thought about France Cordova, you know, the last president. I mean, she was a, an English major from Stanford and ended up with a physics PhD from Caltech. Maybe we're trying to get this together too fast. Maybe our science and our, our, uh, our engineering schools, which are saying, well, you have the calculus, you got all this, you got, you know, maybe we need to go and look at liberal arts majors and how do we transition them in and vice versa. Why don't we take the engineers and send them into politics and send them into other places? Maybe we're looking at an arc that might be just a little too long because you just have to know so much. But of course, in this world today, you just have to know so much. But hey, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>